Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Wound Care Today Facebook Live. A massive thank you to you all for joining us tonight. We're well aware how busy you are. I'm also well aware that a few weeks ago, we would have been outside clapping you guys, the heroes. So please know that your continued excellence and utter commitment to patients across the UK is at the forefront of our minds. You are ama amazing and continue to inspire us. So thank you very much. Uh, tonight's event is called Breaking Barriers, the Challenges and Management of Leaky Legs. And our speaker tonight is an advanced nurse practitioner from the Mount Surgery in Pontypool. And it's the amazing Rachel Dragon. Good night, Ra good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Ed. Thank you for having me here tonight. Absolute pleasure. You are rocking the hair. So thank you. It looks fantastic. Thank you. It's my gay pride hair. So I've got a bit of blue, a bit pink, a bit purple. Just going for it. Um, it looks fantastic, and it matches the necklace. Sorry, I missed that. It matches the necklace. Oh yeah, my necklace, my Indian uh, motorcycle necklace, because I really want a sixty bobber. So I'm, I'm waiting until I, you know, I win the lottery to get my. Indian motorbike, and then I'll be uh, well away. You look fantastic. I've never Thank felt you. so dull, and I need to. Sort and so do you, even though you didn't, <laughs> even though you didn't have your uh, your hair done, especially for tonight. I didn't, um, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, um, Rachel's doing tonight's event from home. So please bear with us if we have any technology problems. I promise you, we'll get them sorted out as soon as possible. Um, the event will be available on our Facebook page forever but also on our website where you can download the slides. As Rachel um, will agree, the more involved you are with tonight's yeah. event, the better it is for her and the event in general. So feel free to leave comments and also please ask any relevant questions and Rachel will endeavor to answer as many as possible at the end of tonight's event. Um, before we start, I would like to thank our partners, Esity. Two years ago, two years ago, we did our first ever Facebook Live. Um, so I'd like to, on behalf of me and the team, a massive thank you for your trust and belief throughout this madness um, and for your continued passion for independent education. Without these events, um, without your support, these events simply could not take place. So a huge thank you. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's star speaker, over to you, Rachel. Well, hello, everybody. And, you know, thank you so much for coming tonight to this Facebook Live, um, where we're going to be looking at the impact of leaky legs to our patients, our client group, and to you, the clinician who's caring for these people. Um, you know, I know you're expecting my colleague in lymphedema, Helen, tonight. And um, she's really sad she can't be with us. Uh, but I do want you to know just how much hard work Helen and my colleague Claire have, from the wound care people have put into this presentation. This is not all of my work. And so I just want to put out there that the majority of this work has come from Helen and Claire. And thank you for pulling all this together. So what are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at leaky legs, wet legs. And to be able to do that, we've got to go back and look at some of the physiology and the pathophysiology behind it so that we can understand why they occur, look at assessment and management, and, and sort of look at how we can begin as a team to break down some of the barriers. So what are leaky legs? What are wet legs? We predominantly see this in lower limb particularly in patients with a diagnosis of lymphovenous disease. Um, you will occasionally see it in cancer-related lymphedema um, and in certain cases of low albumin um, problems. But for you and me in the community working together, it is predominantly a lymphovenous disease of the lower limb. The posh term, we call it lymphorrhea. Um, it occurs when the lymph and the pressure of the fluid within the tissues of the legs starts to leak out and run down the legs. And we can see huge volumes of fluid going that way. 
if I said the word hemorrhage to you, I get the feeling that, you know, red flags would wave, alarm bells would ring, and, you know, we'd be applying direct pressure to the bleeding area to try and reduce the blood loss. And I have another really excellent colleague called Rebecca Elwell, um, who's an AMP and lymphedema specialist. And she says leaky legs should be ringing the same alarm bells and requiring of us to apply pressure like we would do in a hemorrhage. So is lymphorrhea a really good term or should we be using something like lymphorrhage so that we can be more proactive in our treatment? I'm afraid I back uh, Rebecca up on that and I think it should be seen as far more serious than we actually give it credence to at the moment. So a picture paints a thousand words. How many of you, hands up, I can't see you, but how many of you have got patients with legs who look like this? You think about the leg itself with the bones, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the tissue. Legs are really, really complicated. Then you add into it that we get older and our legs start to swell because of venous problems. They begin to ulcerate, they begin to leak. And often making a diagnosis of what is happening in a pair of legs like you've got on the computer right now, on your screen right now, is this lymphedema, is this chronic edema, is this lymphovenous edema? I would say the diagnosis is, is very, very complex. But what we really need to be doing is breaking this problem down with our patients, empowering our patients, handing their legs back to them. Don't laugh, I know it sounds ridiculous. And saying, between us, we can sort this problem out. So what are the consequences of legs like in the picture I've just shown you? Um, the quality of life and the impact. Uh, as Hopkins said, lives are destroyed jobs are lost, marriages break down, people who have spent 45 years in the same double bed suddenly are sleeping on their own in a chair downstairs. The leg becomes heavier, they can't walk, they can't mobilize. And we've all been into those houses where the patients sit there with their legs on towels that are sopping the social isolation, the smell of the lymphorrhea or lymphorrhage, for the want of a better word. So heavy legs make it hard to move. Any fitness fanatics out there? No, I'm not, but anyone out there, do you remember the first time you ever put weights on your ankles? Do you remember how difficult it made mobilization and balance? Will you imagine carrying four extra kilos in your calves alone? When I used to lecture AMP um, at Sheffield and Bristol Uni, I would do horrible things to students, like wrapping their legs in weights and wet towels, um, giving them really big aprons to carry around. They found it quite difficult, I think, but it gave them an insight into something that a large percentage of our housebound patients cope with on a daily basis. So come on, Rachel, let's get going. Consequences of leaky legs for you, the nurse, the physio, the healthcare support worker, the auxiliary nurse, the doctor. It's time consuming, prolonged treatment, increased workload. It's soul destroying. We shouldn't use the word heart sink, but you know, we do. You think, oh, Mr. B again, 45 minutes are allocated for his legs. This is gonna take me 90. Um, you know, the time that we spend, the risk of complications for our patients. Morgan and Thomas in 2018, hello Karen, hello Mel, um, over 55% of community nurses' workload was treating wet legs. And then from that, you have to add in the risk of cellulitis and admission to hospital. 400 pounds a day in 2017 to stay in hospital, but that does include your treatment. And that doesn't include the cost that goes up when your BMI is raised. So, you know, I'm gonna advocate for you right now. I need you to Google, once this is over, not right now, but once this is over, Google the wet leg pathway by um, Morgan and Thomas, 
2018, the PDF is there. Download it, read it, use it. It is an amazing piece of evidence-based care. Use it. So, consequences of leaky legs continuing for you clinically and for your patients. Losing high volumes of fluid, okay? And we know that full therapeutic compression is a gold standard we should be going for, but we're not doing it. We over rely on wound care. Um, we, we keep it to ourselves. The patients feel stigmatized. They keep it to themselves. So put it out there, you know, make this a multidisciplinary team issue. Go for dermatology, go for microbiology, get your tissue viability uh, clinicians involved. Encourage the lymphedema service. Yes, I know not every lymphedema service will see a non-cancer related chronic edema. But without you asking, the CCGs will never be aware that there is a need. Encourage the family, the, fa the carers, concerned individuals, empower the GPs and the general practice nurses, share the workload, share the cost, make a joint plan that everyone can agree to, and if possible, put that patient in charge of the plan. Let them be empowered by it. So why do leaky legs occur? What is the pathophysiology involved? What goes wrong? I'm really sorry, guys. Put your thinking caps on. Think back to when we were in uh, first year uni, undergrad, pre-reg nurse training, pre-reg, um, medicine, physio, OT, whatever. Go back to that. Think about what you remember from your physiology and anatomy of the circulatory system. Do you remember the hours we spent on that? How many hours did you spend on the lymphatic system? <laughs> yeah, not many. All forms of edema is simply down to a failure of the lymphatic system to cope with the amount of tissue fluid that is produced through capillary filtration. So the cells of the body are bathed in tissue fluid. Another term is extracellular fluid. And edema occurs when the pressure within the vessels forces fluid out of the vessels, obeys the tissue, but it exceeds the ability of the lymphatic system to reabsorb that fluid. Okay, so blood pressure forces plasma out of, out of the bloodstream into the tissue spaces, bathes the cells in protein, glucose, and oxygen rich fluid. The cells take up what they need, excrete what they don't need, and their excretory and waste products. And for the most part, 100% of that fluid that is formed by capillary filtration is then reabsorbed by your lymphatics cleaned and returned back to your circulatory system higher up closer to the heart. So the lymph in lymphovenous disease, what we're seeing is a failure of the venules within the legs to actually control and prevent the backflow of blood. So you get a buildup of blood pressure within the venous compartments of the legs. And that venous blood pressure exceeds tissue pressure. So fluid flows out of the, 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 the venules and the capillary bed and fills the tissue spaces. The lymphatics become engorged and unable to cope with that volume of fluid until eventually the fluid stays where it is and the legs begin to swell. I hope that's making a bit of sense, yeah? So, you know, we need those lymphatics to work for us, but we also need to think about reducing the pressure in the venous system. So going back to our circulatory system and lymphovenous disease, if you remember, the circulatory system is a high pressure system. Blood moves simply because we have a muscular contraction of the left ventricle of the heart, forcing blood around your body. Lymph circulation has no such pump. The only reason lymph is moving in you and I right now 
is because we are breathing and we are moving. If we don't breathe deeply and if we remain sedentary, our lymph will not move a great deal, which means it will be unable to mop up that extracellular fluid formed by capillary filtration. The other thing is, is the lymphatic system is part of our immune system and it cleans and filters the lymphatic fluid, mopping up debris, viruses, bacteria, toxins, okay? And it cleans it by passing that fluid through a lymph node. So, you know, you talk about your glands in your neck, it's exactly the same principle. So when the lymph system fails, your immune system in that part of the limb that the lymph is responsible for also fails. So your patient with chronic edema and lymphovenous disease is now at a massively increased risk of erysipelas and cellulitis. So from now on, I'm not gonna say erysipelas because it's too many consonants. I'm gonna say cellulitis, okay? Does that make sense so far? I really hope it does. So lymphovenous disease, high pressure in the venous system forces fluid into the tissues. The lymphatics fail to compensate, fail to absorb that excess fluid. So the legs become edematous. And have you ever noticed that legs become shiny and that the hair doesn't grow? I know we always attribute poor hair growth in, in, in swollen legs or in any legs, really, not down to waxing. No, we're not millennials here. We're talking about hair that doesn't grow because we're thinking of arterial insufficiency, i.e. lack of oxygen. It's exactly the same in lymphovenous disease. Hair won't grow when the distance that the oxygen has to diffuse across is so great that it will never reach the hair follicle. And one of the things that you will notice once you reduce the edema through compression and skincare, movement, exercise and weight management, what you will notice is the hair starts to grow back. And I've got a lovely, lovely lady who I am still closely involved with in general practice, Mrs. B. Uh, 70 yards, came in with massive legs, lymphorrhea, you got her into compression, and her one moment to me was, thanks Rachel, I'm growing hair again, shall I shave them? No, I said, don't shave them, rejoice. We had a good laugh about that, honestly. So how are we going to assess? Okay, have you all seen this document? Have you all seen the six S's of chronic edema management in the community written by Women Care People last year. Empower yourself through knowledge. Use those best practice statements and best practice documents. And I would say start with this. If you're empowered and you're knowledgeable, you can empower and impart knowledge to your team and to your patient, most importantly. So assessment is crucial. And what this document suggests is that we can use six S's. Story, self-care, sight, skin, size, and shape. When you're assessing swollen legs, don't just go to the knee. I'm afraid it does involve you going as far up as the groin and the waist. Look at that patient's body as a whole if you can, okay? But don't just roll the trousers up or lift the skirt up. This needs an evaluation from waist to toe. So the story, get the patient's story. How does the edema make them feel? How long has it been there? Who have they asked in the past? What interventions and investigations have they had? Look at their lifestyle. Look at their medication. As we know, um, popular antihypertensives, amylodipine, philodipine, they belong to a group of drugs called ch calcium channel blockers. They all cause peripheral edema. So are we making that patient's swollen ankles, swollen lower legs worse by the type of medication they're on? Talk to the GP, talk to your prescribing AMP, see if there's something else we can do. Look at the nutrition, protein is so important. Low protein states will result in a worsening of the edema. Okay, you happy? Right, let's crack on. 
self-care wow this is so important this is about you the healthcare professional giving responsibility for the patient's legs back to that patient in as much as you are able and that fits in with the long-term nhs plan do you remember your sociology and your social science lessons but do you remember the sick role i think it was talcott parsons round about 1950-51, who sort of presented this social um, hypothesis of the sick role in that illness is a deviance from normal function and the patient is no longer responsible for being ill. Therefore, they're automatically exempt from normal duties and for responsibility from themselves. The only thing they've got to do is try to get well and do as they're told by the doctor and nurse. So, you know, if you think about Carry On Doctor, where Lancelot Spratt stands at the bottom of the bed, barking orders at the patient. Well, let's turn that on its head now. Sorry, I clicked, uh, clicked the... Uh, let's turn that on its head, okay, and um, look at... Sorry, I'm still clicking the wrong one. Forgive me, it is my computer. Um... Turn that on its head and we'll, we'll, we'll look at a different chronic illness model. Okay, the chronic illness model says we need to hand responsibility for ill health back to the patient and help them to address the issues in their lifestyle, give them the power back and say to them, this is what we are going to do to get you back into the new normal. We also need to take into account things like dependency, immobility, hormonal changes. And we do need in acute edema to be investigating for heart failure, kidney and liver disease, okay? But really we're dealing at the moment in this presentation with chronic long-standing edema. And this is where we know that loop diuretics don't work. The edema that is caused by obesity, dependency and immobility, leads to a vicious cycle of an increase in edema, increase in weight of legs, decreased mobility, and so on and so forth. And while you're sat sedentary, remember what I said, lymph only flows when you move and you breathe. So if you're not moving very much, that lymph is going to remain static. The other thing to think about when we talk about the site of the swelling is, is this bilateral or unilateral? And I'm always, always wary of a unilateral um, lower, limb, limb, uh, lower limb edema because this could be the site of something more, um, more serious, it's like a DVT, um, a primary lymphedema that we've not uh, diagnosed, a recurrence or a new malignancy, okay? So just think, if this is only one leg that is swollen, why is it only one leg? Because normally in lymphovenous disease, it affects both legs, okay? Skin care, oh my goodness, skin care. Skin care, skin care, skin care. Make sure the patient has a repeat prescription for an emollient to wash with and to apply. It is the first cornerstone of chronic edema care. Look after the skin. Wash the legs, pat them dry, check for commonly occurring fungal infections between the toes, check for little scratches that are leaking uh, amber lymph lymphatic fluid, and treat the hyperkeratosis with really good emollients. We know good skin care will reduce the episodes of cellulitis to such an extent that we not only save morbidity and mortality in our patients, but we also impart um, self-care rituals for the patient, for the carer, for their important others. Um, and we make sure that we're saving money in the long run for the NHS. And I'm sorry, it does come down to that, doesn't it? Look at the size of the limb, right? Any of you that have had experience in lymphedema departments will know that we calculate uh, volumes of limbs. You don't need to do that. 
what I recommend, if you can see on the slide now, um, just a simple picture of how where to measure below the knee. So we'd say around the base of the toes, the metacarpal interval, sort of uh, yeah, base of toes. Don't get don't get um, complicated here, right? So around the base of the toes, the width from the ankle to the top of the the the, the bend of the ankle, the Y measurement, the narrowest part of the ankle where the uh, Achilles tendon goes into the gastrocnemius or calf muscle, the fattest part of the calf, and then two fingers below uh, the knee cap itself will give you a good measure. Write them down, and then when you're applying your treatment, measure at the same places, and you will see a reduction with good treatment, with good compression, good skincare, and mobilization as much as you can get the patient to do so. I hope that's okay. You don't need anything complex. You just need a set point from where you are all going to measure as a team. Okay, typical this, isn't it? How many of us have seen this? Hands up, yeah. Inverted champagne bottle legs from really pretty much inappropriate compression being applied and not being applied far enough up the limb. Um, many limbs are irregular in shape. Uh, you'll notice presence of skin folds. Uh, you'll notice swollen toes or the dorsum of the foot is particularly swollen. But remember what I said earlier, we should be looking at these legs all the way up to the thigh and to the waist. We should be taking the whole lower half of the body into consideration and testing and looking addressing skin issues and looking at the shape because we may need to compress all the way up to the waist, okay? Not often, but we might. So how are we gonna break down barriers to this, to this big problem? 55% of community nurses in Cardiff, that was their workload, going in and helping patients with wet legs. So we all know, we all do this holistic assessment, fluid management, skin care, encouraging the patient to take care for themselves, patient education. If I said to you, empowering you through education, you can empower your patient. But the cornerstone is skin care, compression therapy, weight management and movement. So, barriers to successful management is that quite often lymphovenous disease is down to the fact that they have an underlying cardiac problem. And inappropriate prescribing of loop diuretics is very, very common. Okay, and we see no difference really in the legs. Just the patient now says they're far more thirsty and they're peeing every morning, all morning. Okay. We also know, Hopkins pointed out to us very clearly, that we're not applying full therapeutic compression because we're afraid of it. We feel that we aren't empowered to do it. So we have the most disenfranchised, socially isolated patients on our workload, and we are disempowered to look after them. We're afraid of Dopplers. We have to do Dopplers as per protocol within your own um, working environment, okay? But we know from Wounds UK, from Morgan and Thomas, from the British Lymphology Society, that we don't always need to Doppler to apply um, a low compressive thought course in the first instance. There's also a thing that I've noticed, and I've seen this quite regularly in my own practice, and I've been working to try and, and, and uh, address this, is that we don't use the absorbent dressings under compression, or if we do, we use them over uh, uh, cotton uh, liners, okay? So maybe, maybe by empowering ourselves with knowledge and empowering our patients, we can spread that knowledge further. I, I hope that's, uh, that's making sense. So why do we apply compression? Simple. It applies pressure to the tissue 
that then counteracts the hypertension in the vessels, so prevents or reduces the amount of tissue fluid being formed, allowing the venous system time to take up the slack and re-deliver that volume of fluid that was sitting in the legs back into the circulation. And it's one of the warnings I always give patients when I put them into bandages. Have Stay by the toilet because when these start to work, you'll start to weep. Being prompt with our treatment, you know, looking at what do I need to apply, okay? Not always able with very fragile or ulcerated or soaking wet skin to say, right, here we go. Here's a class two compression stocking. It's not going to work. We need to think about bandages or wrap systems. And I am a huge fan of the wrap system because it gives a bit more power back to the patient, to their carers and to their important others. It allows them to take charge of their own care. Whereas a bandage relies on you to go in three, four times a week, apply that bandage. A wrap system can mean that you only need to go in once or twice a week just to oversee it. So I'm a huge fan of them. Engage with your patient. Get it right first time. Don't think, right, Mr. Smith doesn't want me to bandage to his toes, so I'll go mid-foot to mid-calf because he's comfortable with that. Or you'll end up with swollen toes and a dorsal of the foot and all the fluid co collecting around the knee and above the bandage, okay? So try to um, encourage and engage the patient to get the compression choice right for them, not for what they think they need because they don't always get that right. And um, my husband now, he's not a medic, but we'll go around Asta and he's knocking me all the way around going, Rachel, shouldn't they have different shouldn't they have different bandages on? That bandage needs to go to the toe. That bandage needs to, and I'm going, I'm shopping. But you know what I'm saying, don't you? The other thing to say is when the bandaging and the wrap system starts to slip, that's a bad sign. It means the volume of edema is reducing. So here we go. We've got back to the same patient that we saw at the beginning of the, the, the talk, some, oh, 30 odd minutes ago now, sorry. Um, this patient has gone through intensive skin treatment, has gone through bandaging, a wrap system, and is now in hosiery. What a difference, what a difference. There must be, I would say, five kilos of fluid gone from those legs. Can you imagine trying to walk with 2.5 kilos of weights around your ankles. As soon as you get rid of that fluid, mobility improve, improves, lymphatic drainage improves, and the patient will start to feel better, empowered, and more independent. Doppler assessment. Now, I've got to say, you really do need to follow your health authority, CCG, local health board, protocols and procedures on Dopplers prior to applying uh, compression okay but if you read the wet leg pathway if you look at wounds uk morgan and thomas british lymphology society mild graduated compression can be safely applied in the absence of a doppler assessment okay so if you've made the assessment and you feel confident i would say try it but if you need to have a Doppler before you can apply compression, then you really have to follow your own health authority's procedure and protocol on this. But you can question who wrote that procedure and protocol. And you can say that there is evidence out here now to suggest it's not always necessary. Remember, you are your patient's advocate. Okay, patient-related barriers. Um, Weight management, yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? Um, I sit here with a BMI above 30. I know it should be 25. I'm a healthcare professional. I really should know better, shouldn't I? So how am I going to tell Mr. Smith with this 150 kilo BMI of 55 to lose weight when he can't walk very well because he's not going to bed at night because his legs are swollen? 
There's lots of reasons for not undertaking exercises, including joint and, and uh, muscle pain, osteoarthritis. Then the patient gets cellulitis and we get them admitted to hospital. Um, how many of you, come on, hands up again. Well, nurse, those hospital nurses got my legs down and dry when you didn't for six months. Yeah, well, for the past two weeks, you've slept in a bed and you've had a physio mobilize you properly. But now you're home, you're back in your recliner and you're shuffling, not walking. So you're not engaging that muscle pump. I'm not saying be blunt. I'm not saying go out there and say, you've got to lose weight, you know, eat dust, that sort of thing. But what I'm saying is be careful, be um, diplomatic. That's the word. Be diplomatic encourage the patient to do exactly what they were doing in the hospital go to bed at night don't shuffle walk hand the responsibility back dressing selection super absorbency now super absorbers are a huge bone of contention in terms of health board and health authority funding because they're expensive but i say Long-term benefit as opposed to, as opposed to short-term cost saves money, saves lives, prevents harm. These are large dressings that we can use. Something like the QT Med Sorbac Sachet, Sachet XL that wraps around the leg. And then as the edema goes down and the leaking stops, step down the absorbency, but carry on with the skincare, carry on with the compression. I'm going to give you a case study of Mr. P. Mr. P and I have a lot in common and we really, really bonded. Yes, I know, we're both slightly plump, okay? It wasn't just that. Mr. P is a biker and he really, really wanted to ride his Harley again with his MC in South Wales. That was the one thing he wanted me to enable him to do. And I said, well, I can't enable you to do that. Only you can get yourself back on that bike. But we've got to get your legs down. You've got to get your legs down. You've got to stop this wet, leaky leg. So we started with bandaging. And I only promised to bandage him if he would do all the other cornerstones of care. That is move more, watch his diet, try and lose a little bit of weight. Okay. He had to take charge of his lifestyle. So it wasn't enough for him to sit in the pub at night with his beer and his peanuts, he had to give one of them up. I suggested the peanuts. No, I'm joking. Anyway, initially we used super absorbers under the really tight two-layer lymphedema bandaging. Once we got his legs down and we could get him into a wrap system, he took over the care himself. And he only came in to see me, I think, once every two weeks once he was in the wraps. Let's put it this way. We stopped his lymphorrhea. Did we? Yeah, we as a team, me and Mr. P. He's now back with his MC and he's back riding. Uh, I think he's got a road king. It's a big, big bike. Anyway, he's a happy bunny. He still wears his wraps. He still wears his garments. And he still works hard to keep his weight down from what it was when I first met him. So... Involving your patient, involving their family, involving their support network. As with Mr. P, I involved his MC. They wanted him back riding. He wanted to be back riding. So we worked on it. Okay. We used a multidisciplinary a multidisciplinary approach, um, and we taught the patient how to monitor for the red flags. Okay. The other thing is, is we have to accept and we have to address early on is how much anxiety and depression having swollen, wet or comfortable legs causes. And we know that there is a key to improving the mood, and reducing anxiety. Just the potential benefits are, are off the scale for us. So the RAP system, as I say, I am really, really keen on the RAP system where you have a liner and then a compressive force that can be applied from the toe all the way up to the thigh 
including a knee piece. They're easy to apply, easy to use, easy to adjust. So let's consider we're a band five or six RN. We're going out to Mr. Smith three times a week. We're allocated 45 minutes to do his bilateral below knee bandaging. We know it's going to take us 90, but we're given 45 minutes. By switching to a RAP system, encouraging the family and the patient to be involved, will reduce the number of hours that you spend bandaging. You can save the, the health board and the patient and the taxpayer up to £9,000 per year. And that means you're freed up to see other people as well. So your 45 minutes, 90, three times a week, possibly five, now comes down to a 20 minute visit where you can spend the time to, with the patient, talking to them about things that matter to them other than their swollen leg. I love Qtimed, I love these super absorbers. I have used them under compression, both wrap systems and bandages. Um, I step down very quickly when the absorbency is no longer required and I apply it as a primary dressing. Um, okay, who out there, mums, dads, uh, babies in disposable nappies? Aren't they amazing? You don't have to change the baby three or four times a night like you would in Terry nappies. It's amazing stuff. Oh, no nappy rash, no macerated skin. Nappy technology, very similar to your super absorbers, wicks the fluid away from the skin, keeping the skin dry and healthy, okay? Why would I apply a super absorber over your blue, yellow, or beige line stockinette? It needs to go underneath and be secured by that stockinette. That's one of the most important things. After all, you mums and dads out there, you wouldn't put your baby into a pair of cotton pants and then put a pair of pampers or buggies or other brands are available on top and expect your baby not to get nappy rash. So your super absorbers make them your primary contact layer with the skin because they are there to wick that irritant fluid away, okay? So my darlings, we have almost reached the end and I will very soon be handing back over to Ed and some questions. But what have we looked at this afternoon or this evening? Crikey, it's dark. What have we looked at this evening? Well, we've looked at the incidence of leaky legs. We've looked at the impact of leaky legs on the patients and their families. We've looked at the complexity, the pathophysiology. We accept it's costly to the NHS, but it's even more costly to our patients who have to live with wet towels under their feet. We know that through holistic and comprehensive assessment, we can form a treatment plan that is inclusive to everyone so that many of the barriers are broken down and correct management can be maintained. Don't assume that your GP is going to know about wet legs or lymphedema. They don't, they're generalists. By empowering you, share your knowledge. Barriers can be broken down and we can achieve successful outcomes for you, but really more importantly for our patients. So, as you know, SAT, uh, formerly BSN and Jobs, have supported us this evening um, in this presentation. And there are many educational tools that we can use um, that are provided for us by ST. We have academy education programmes where we've got up to, I think it's about 18 different modules on chronic edema, genital edema, managing... Um, uh, breast edema. We've also got an ambassador program that we have been rolling out now, which I think is the most amazing way of spreading the love and spreading the knowledge. The ambassador program involves all community nurses and tissue viability nurses. Shout out to Jack Stark, uh, over in Swindon, and her fabulous team of TVNs who have adopted our ambassador program there big time. What we do is we go out. We teach you, 
you then become your ambassador within your district nursing team. So you teach your team. You don't become the go-to for lymphedema. No, no, no. The idea is you teach your team and then your team teaches others. And it spreads out that way like a rippled surface. Okay, like throwing a stone into a still pond. Those ripples keep going, okay? We have clinical evidence, including best practice statements. Look at the chronic edema booklet that we've been using. And we have assessment tools to help you, particularly if you're an AQN, a newly qualified nurse, particularly if you're a newly qualified nurse in the community, just to help you and support you in your decision making. So what I suggest to do, if you're really interested in these ambassador programs, who knows, I might get to meet you face to face, or I might get to meet you over a Teams meeting because I help to run these. Um, contact your ST account manager or contract uh, concierge.services at st.com. Okay, Ed, so I'm going to hand right back over to you. I hope tonight's been good and I'm waiting for your questions. Rachel, thank you. Um, that was absolutely exceptional. Um, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all your comments, all your questions and your kind words. Um, and also for your patience in the first five minutes. Rachel, you froze a couple of times. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's really silly. I, I, have a, I have a horrible feeling your kids went on PlayStation. Um, <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, Probably. It, it would be Digimon that they were playing. Oh, don't joke. Um, guys, the, the video will be available on the Wound Care Today website in its entirety without any freezing, so don't worry at all. Um, Rach, do you mind if we crack on with the questions? We've got so Go many. for it, let's start. Fantastic, so question one. It can be hard to tell the difference between red legs and cellulitis. How can we make a diagnosis? Absolutely brilliant question, thank you. Um, red legs in themselves tend to be bilateral, Cellulitis is nearly always unilateral, okay? So it's only gonna affect one leg. Red legs, your patient will be sat up, drinking a cup of tea, eating, chatting to you, and will be clinically and systemically well. They will not have flu-like illness. They will not have a temperature. They will not feel miserable. They will not be complaining of pain in their legs or leg. So with cellulitis, what you're going to find is the patient tends to be going quite unwell. They might be spiking a temp and it's usually just one leg. Fantastic. Is that okay? Yeah, look, it's brilliant. I'm staring at all the questions coming in. Oh uh, gosh. The engagement levels tonight have been insane. So thank you everyone who's out there. So thank question you. two, shared care is really topical at the moment. What has been your experience so far? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, as you know, I started life as a, a, an AMP in general practice. I then moved into lymphedema um, and then moved back to general practice. But by being in lymphedema, just for the few years that I worked there, I built bridges with the uh, vascular nurse specialists and vascular team, Prof Harding's team at the Wound Care Centre in Cardiff the tissue viability clinicians and the podiatrists within my health board, by getting involved with all these people who have interests in skin, skin integrity, and keeping patients healthy, we all started to work together. So I would say I would be getting referrals into lymphedema from podiatry, where just a little bit of compression on the foot made all the difference to the diabetic foot ulcer. I'm not talking massive compression, a little. Um, working with vascular teams in really severe arterial disease. And with them, applying a bit of compression and seeing changes. So I've been really, really lucky and working with the multidisciplinary team, even in my new job now, where I rely heavily upon district nurses, tissue viability nurses, diabetic nurses, podiatrists, it's all there. Thank you, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so, question three. I think leaky legs has become a bigger problem since COVID, with patients not mobilising or leaving home. Rachel, what do you think? I completely and utterly agree with you. Given that, as well, the fear of going out the fear of walking down the road, 
um, the percentage of elderly patients now who I want to see in my clinic room in general practice to review them, but won't come. They're frightened. Um, it's almost, we've almost made a generation of people become agoraphobic. And yes, I completely agree with that observation from that, that, that member uh, who's watching. Uh, leaky legs and immobility have skyrocketed and the consequences thereof. Yeah, it's, um, it's the feedback we've been getting from our community over the last few months has said exactly the same. So yes, I mean, it's an ongoing problem. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that tonight and events like this will help healthcare professionals engage with the patients at home, mm -hmm. explain the relevance of proper clinical care. Yeah, absolutely. Question four from Christine. Can you explain what the RAP systems are and can anyone apply these? Yes, um, the RAP systems, uh, depending on where you, you, you know, which manufacturer you go for, I'm very comfortable obviously with the SOT wrap systems, the job strap systems. But remember there are other wrap systems out there. Medi make them, Juzo make them. The wrap system is essentially um, a bandage with Velcro. So if you think I wish I'd got one to show you actually, I wish I'd, I'd brought one down with me from my clinical bag. If you think about the old putties of World War One that the men wore in the trenches, these are a, a stiff material that you wrap around the limb and then adjust the compression using the Velcro. Once they're demonstrated how to apply, they are so simple to apply. Anyone can apply them. Carers can apply them. Family can apply them. They just need showing a few times. That's all. And they also know just how to adjust them. So if Mr. Smith is saying, oh, my toes are going a bit numb, then loosen the wrap system off once they've got up and had a walk. Brilliant. Thank you. So the next question from Yvonne. Could you clarify the use of absorbance under compression, please, under or over the cotton bandage? OK, simple. Thanks, Yvonne. And thank you for asking that question. Super absorbance should be the primary layer applied to the skin. They should not go over anything else apart from the cream that you've applied to keep the skin supple. They, uh, they, they sit on the skin like the pampers nappy sits on your baby's bottom, okay? You can secure them with a cotton liner. You can secure them with micropore tape. Other tapes are available, but they must be the primary layer. You then put your compression on top of that. And as the volume of the leg goes down, the leaking will reduce. And as the leaking will reduce, you reduce the amount of absorption you need to put under the compression until eventually all you will actually need is a cotton liner because the skin is intact, the integrity is maintained, and there's no more leaking. Is that okay? Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. So a question from Julie. What if patients have heart failure? Good question, Julie. Really, really good question. Um, patients in unstable heart failure, no. Do not compress. Do not even go there, okay? Um, anyone that's in unstable heart failure really, you know, needs more intensive forms of medical intervention uh, and monitoring. Uh, stable heart failure, under, from my understanding, stable heart failure with a decent kidney function, we can start compression. Gently, carefully, but we can do it. Okay, thank you. So question coming through from Vicky. Do you have any guidance on patient engagement and losing weight? Sorry, did I go from the screen then? You Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lymphedema Network Wales have got a document which um, we didn't want to call, but we have called it the Obesity Protocol. I'm not sure if that is available online or not. It is, that is the mother of all difficult conversations, isn't it? Um, a lot of lymphedema services and chronic edema services will not begin to bandage people with certain, um, certain BMIs. Um, 
this is about engagement it's about encouragement it's about finding that common ground and not everyone we can't do that with every patient i admit it um i had a patient yesterday measured him for for compression for lymphovenous edema and he just turned around and said do you know what i don't want this and it broke my heart so I'm hopefully going to get him back and try again. And I think the thing is for us as healthcare professionals is to be patient and to be persistent um, and to all sing from the same message. But yeah. No, I don't know about guidance. Thank you. Uh, next question from Kate. Can you apply compression without an ABPI? If you read the work by Morgan and Thomas, Wounds UK, BLS, uh, yes, you can apply low graduated compression to a limb that you have done a vascular assessment on. And I, you've got to remember, I'm a band, you know, I, I'm an experienced AMP and I rely more on my own vascular assessment, my little fat fingers and my two eyes, what I see, what I feel, than I do necessarily on an on ABPI. ABPIs on, on edematous limbs are notoriously inaccurate, uh, don't actually really add to our decision making or give us any uh, power to that decision making. So yes, carefully looking at the documentation, using low compression or lower compression, I would compress without an ABPI. But I have to caveat that for you, my lovely. You have got to go by your uh, local health board, CCG protocol guidance. Brilliant. Thank you. So we've got two more, two more questions, and then you can politely say goodbye and then pour that glass of red wine or white wine that you were talking about earlier. So oh, yeah. last question is from um, Elena. Elena, if I mispronounce your name, I apologise. What if there is no swelling but the legs are still leaking? Oh, good question. Now, I have had a lady like this um, and she had such severe arterial disease, but her legs were absolutely pouring fluid. Uh, I was not comfortable to compress. Uh, we did do an ABPI on her and it did show... Um, a severe, severe arterial insufficiency. I think it was below, below 0.3. Uh, and, and the, you know, when you're listening to your Doppler, um, there was very little in the way of waveform anyway. With that lady, no, I didn't compress, but I did teach her the mainstay of skincare. I did teach her the mainstay of super absorbency, um, supported bandaging, um, and I did refer her into the vascular surgeons for more help. Does that help? It does. Brilliant. Thank you. So our last question from Steph. Rachel, any ideas for advanced dementia patients who take dressings off as soon as we leave? I know. I know. Okay. Yeah, I have because... Um, as many of you know, uh, I, I care for my parents. And um, yeah, I found that I've got um, a fiddle mat and I do the dressing, distract the patient and give them a fiddle mat. And it's, it, you'll, you can make them yourself. Uh, you can buy them at expense, but I've made them and you put, uh, it's just a little square of cloth with different textures, Velcro, uh, all sorts of things, and distract away with from the advanced, you know, it, it didn't, you know, I can remember the days of the, the golf, uh, of, of the boxing gloves. Yeah, I, I'm that old, thanks. Um, but the, I've got a fiddle mat for, 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 for one of my members of family. So yeah, uh, distraction. Listen, th thank you so much. And, um, I just thought the event was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, I think you're a star. The feedback from our audience has been amazing. So thank you for your comments, your questions, and for your very kind words. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the certificate is available now for download. So you'll see that on the screen. You'll see that in the comments. 
So please feel free to download that. And for more information on any of our events or education, please visit our website, which is wooncare-today.com. So that concludes tonight's event. Rachel, thank you again. Thank you, Ed. Lovely, lovely evening. Um, thank you to Essity, not just for tonight, but for two years of friendship and partnership. It means a great deal. And to our team at Wound Care today and to Mole for another fantastic evening. Thank you. And then last but not least, to all you inspiring healthcare professionals out there, um, have a lovely evening. Stay safe. Stay strong. And I'll see you all very soon. Good night. Thank Take care, everybody. Good night.